finish it February. <laughs> uh, we'll see if that's even possible. Do you ever get into these moods where you aren't quite sure if what you're feeling is project paralysis or maybe it's a weird kind of startitis keeping you from doing the things you need to get done? Or maybe you're just procrastinating for some weird reason? Procrastinating, maybe? <laughs> Hi, it me. Actually, it's been me for the past couple of weeks. Or so. I have two, maybe three fairly large or at least time consuming projects I need to get started, but I also want to try posting more often, you know, more than once every two months. So I've gotten myself into a situation where I should be filming or casting on or winding a shuttle, and instead I'm distracted by granny squares. There is an alternate reality where my grandmother tried to teach me crochet and instead of walking away and proclaiming it was easy after learning how to chain stitch, I actually used it to make things and in that reality nothing ever got done because that world is now covered in granny squares. The square root of all evil. <laughs> Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I swear they're like potato chips around here. Finish a granny square, get a hit of dopamine from an easily finished project. I started off making squares from the Red Heart all-in-one granny square yarn for the review video a couple of weeks ago and trading off colorways and finishing off with black yarn instead of white. If you were at all conflicted over that yarn after my review, I'll just say this. They're relatively easy and they grow on you. The hardest part is literally obtaining the yarn. And now I've graduated to an entirely different granny square. One that for the most part requires about the same amount of end weaving and a whole lot less angst about meeting your gauge. If you like last angst about making gauge, boop the like button and insert mandatory like, subscribe, and check out my Patreon here. My patrons are pretty fantastic, by the way, so a big thank you to them. You know who you are, and now everyone else does too. Basically, I have some Red Heart Retro Stripe I picked up about a year ago when I was gainfully employed, hoping it would color pool like the Neon Stripe, but no. The color segments are too long, and it's been languishing in the bottom of a bin ever since, waiting for me to figure out what I'm going to do with it. I lost the receipt during the take back seize window, and there's a stubborn part of me that's just certain that I can make it into something really nice if I try. Mainly because it's pretty. Don't judge me. I looked it up on Ravelry, and I found out people are making sunburst granny square blankets with it, and I just happen to have a bunch of balls of the stuff. There's granny squares everywhere now. It's granny squares all the way down. When I'm working on video planning, granny squares. Editing, granny squares. When I'm being social on Final Fantasy late at night and don't want to run around in circles while I'm waiting for people to form up in groups, I work on a granny square and it's stupidly satisfying. Seriously, anyone who plays a massively multiplayer online game can tell you that unless you have something to do with your hands, you will literally run your character around in circles, practically parkouring off the scenery just to distract yourself, while Nine Jaguar fetches cookies out of the oven, or Three Ocelot wrangles their toddler, or Prime Serpent goes to get a soda, but we really know he's not getting a soda. He's going out for a smoky treat on the back porch, and goodness only knows when he's going to be back, because he'll have a huge case of the munchies, and will spend the next half hour looking for that bag of nachos he doesn't remember he finished two weeks ago, so it's either run around in circles or take up a real life or in-game craft while you wait. Might be talking from experience there. I used to knit socks between flight points in World of Warcraft and now I crochet granny squares in Final Fantasy XIV while waiting for the Leap of Faith to pop up in the gold saucer and I know that only like three of you got that reference but you're probably laughing your butts off and that's what makes it worthwhile. Like the highly motivated self-starter I am, 
The apron I completed last month has been ripped apart and is patiently waiting for me to get over my not at all completely embarrassing fascination with acrylic yarn and repetitive patterns. It's going to be fine, folks. Speaking of Ravelry giving me ideas, I'm going to have to take a look and see what people are doing with their OG Karen cakes because I have an obscene amount of the fairy cake colorway. Both Mum and I bought a small blanket's worth at entirely separate times. I'd even offered to give her my yarn if she liked it that much, but no dice. Now I have enough to cover a full king-size bed, probably. We'd both been making granny stripe blankets, but with the planned pooling neon stripe blanket I'm working on, that might just be too much granny stitch, so it's back into storage while I figure out what I want to do with it. Newer and more convoluted granny squares, maybe. This may be turning into a bit of an obsession. To be completely honest, it's the time of year where I have a lot of trouble being productive, and a lot of that is my own fault. It's a perfect storm of beginning of the year planning, butting headfirst into known quantities like shifting weather patterns and unknown quantities like people in the husbeast's office bringing their children's viruses to work instead of boxes of girl guide cookies which i guess is better than delivering the viruses with the cookies but at least then you'd have cookies to unpack all of that minus the cookies because they're more carbs than i really should be having i live in the foothills of alberta canada we have a weather pattern known as the chinook at its most basic, it's a warm Pacific wind that deposits its snows in the mountains on the way over and then proceeds to warm up a very narrow corridor of geography. Once it leaves that area and comes into contact with the colder temperatures on the rest of the prairie, it turns into a fast-moving weather pattern of storms and bitterly cold winds. When I lived in Ontario, we referred to it as the Alberta Clipper. And as always, Wikipedia is your buddy if you'd like to learn more about this very niche weather pattern. Not gonna lie, the Chinook brings some fantastic mild winter weather. You spend more time in your fall or spring jacket or a warm sweater than you do your winter coat. Unfortunately, if you're a migraine sufferer, you have to deal with a lot of weather pressure shifts and related headaches. I find January-February is usually a haze of ibuprofen and regret, because while the generally dry weather means less arthritis, Chinooks bring a unique pain that will have you lounging in a hot bathtub for four hours with an ice pack on your forehead, and it's not as much fun as it sounds, particularly if you're stuffing towels in all the cracks around the door, plus pulling the shower curtain to make the room as dark as possible. Luckily, this year's pressure seems fairly steady so far, Great for my noggin, but just further proof that climate change is happening. We are getting snow though, and that's good. We've had a drought the past couple of years, and the waterfowl are getting mighty testy. I mentioned I have some near future plans. I have designs on making a shirt, a collar, and a pair of socks. Not necessarily in that order, and because I need to make a mock-up, I'll be making two shirts. No worries, I think I know how I'm going to give both shirts different flavors. As I don't particularly want to cut up any bed sheets, and I can use all the comfy tops I can get, I hit the clearance section of Fabricland, and I came home with at least two more fabrics than I had planned. These two are a linen blend, which I really wasn't expecting to find at Fabricland, so color me impressed. And this is a Madras print. Cotton, I think. I've got about five meters of each, which should hopefully give me a little wiggle room for any kind of screw-ups. I'm thinking of making the mock-up from the pink. And I'm entertaining ideas about the other two. The rose on white might become a really nice peasant blouse or similar to go under a dress maybe. I'm thinking of making a cashmere dress from the check. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Charlie from the Stitchery, but she's hacked her favorite knit dress pattern to make a cozy hooded winter dress. I'm considering finding some cozy fleece if I can and doing a little pattern hacking of my own. I have one of the newer McCall's patterns, new as in the past three to five years, I think. 
in their expanded sizing up to something like a 32W. It'll mean changing the neckline, altering the sleeves to raglan, and adding the hood, but it's a princess seam dress with similar lines as Charlie's old standby, which I believe is McCall's 7439. If this works, it might be a good option for some of us larger ladies who can't fit into 7439 and don't want to draft our own. The two dresses call for different fabrics. Charlie's calls for jersey knits and mine calls for cotton, sateen, poplin, or denim. And aside from the sleeves and the neckline, they're structured very similarly. So I'm going to try using the stretchier fabric for mine. If anything, it might make the dress a little more forgiving in terms of fit. So I'll be keeping an eye out for some fleece or warm jersey, basically sweatshirt material, or maybe even a stretch velvet if I'm feeling particularly adventurous. I think pattern hacking is probably the next step in teaching myself sewing and patterning. I've done a little previously to work out fit on a project. It's probably only a matter of time before I put together my own bodice block because I do want to eventually make the walkaway dress. And while there are ways to slash and enlarge the pattern, I'm thinking redrafting it to my own measurements might be a better idea. I'm sure many of you have already seen Closet Historian's version, which is why I'm even considering doing it this way. If you'd like to see the other method, check out Ashley Main's channel. If you haven't heard of her, and if you're into plus-sized retro fashion, you probably should. I'll have a link in the description. And yes, I've dangled tatting in front of my audience a couple of times. There will be some tatting coming down the pike. I'm just trying to figure out how in-depth I want to get in a public interest video. There's a part of me that's considering adding a more in-depth video and updated pattern notation to my Patreon, and if I have them turned on at the time, channel members, in case anyone else wants to try their hand at it. Now, obviously, the original pattern is available for free on the internet, and if you're an experienced tatter, it's likely all you'll need. When the time comes, I'll be including that pattern information with the public video. The reason I'd be putting the very niche, in-depth breakdown behind a paywall is precisely because it will take some effort to put the whole package together. As it is, if you're a $10 patron, you have access to a small library of patterns I've either created or mostly in the case of antique patterns, updated and or reformatted for modern crafting. I've been using the community tab a little bit more and trying to come up with fun things like behind the scenes on the granny squares and poles. Some of you may have seen the topics in the last poll and yes, those are projects I'm working on. They're just vague enough to not give everything away. I'm trying to strike a balance where I can talk about what I'm working on without giving away any surprises because other than the Husbeast, you folks are the people I talk with about my channel. There were a few questions and suggestions in the comments on that poll. So just to respond quickly here, or at least as quickly as it gets, how did I get into historical costume? My parents went to a lot of effort with the Halloween costumes when I was a kid. Unfortunately, because photos were on film back then and somewhat expensive to have to have processed, the only real catalog is my memory. So things like Holly Hobby, the Blue Fairy complete with wings, Wonder Woman, one year mum used a pajama pattern to turn my brother and I into Care Bears, and when the Ghostbusters was really popular, the whole family pitched in to work on my brother's costume. Dad made the logos and tags. I helped paint them on the uniform, and Mum wired up the proton pack. Yes, she did the electronics, because she was a ham operator and knew how to read schematics. Apparently, she used to do schematics in her head to get to sleep at night, so I guess that's a new kind of boring. I also was a preteen and a teenager during the 1980s, and there was a lot of fantasy in the movies. Legend, The Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, and historical dramas like Lady Jane and A Room with a View. So my first real forays into costuming were mostly fantasy and Tudor-era inspired. 
We're not even going to talk about the year Cats was everywhere because if anything, it was proof of the influence of advertising. The touring production started a real wave of Cats mania that we're still trying to figure out in this century. Now I'm just making things as time permits and choosing things I like from anywhere in history that suits my needs or desired look because I can. Where do I find plus-sized patterns? Oh boy. Short answer? Wherever I can. Here's the problem. The costuming community loves drama. And I'm very much trying to keep my eyes on my work and get things done because otherwise you wind up in an echo chamber of all of the same outfits all of the time. A pattern company that's everyone's darling one moment is borderline cancelled the next, and it's not like I have the time and money to thoroughly research every company and repurchase patterns, particularly when finding something in my size is really seriously difficult and I may already have a pattern that fits. It's just that a percentage of my viewers don't like that company, for whatever reason. And whatever your thoughts, those opinions may be entirely valid. The rest of the viewers have either never heard of the drama or they don't give a flying frack on a rolling donut, which is also fair because they too just want a pattern that fits. Or the entertainment of seeing me trying to figure out a novel new cuff construction method. So that's an unwanted frustration that a lot of straight-sized people don't necessarily have to go through. There are plenty of pattern producers and retail companies catering to their demographic. Not so much mine. When a pattern maker who extends their sizing to mid-fat and super-fat decides to air their unpopular opinion, it often hurts me more than it hurts them. And unfortunately, the advice to just draft my own patterns for myself is horribly naive, considering all the adjustments I should be making to even commercial patterns to get them fitting correctly. If I was sewing solely for my own amusement and didn't have any deadlines I needed to keep, I might entertain the notion. But when you're trying to make something to post a video in a week or two, that's just not always feasible. You'd be surprised how much time it takes just to move the camera around while sewing a project. I think Shannon Makes did a video or two about the process, and it's not easy. And I guess that just loops back to what I was saying earlier about working my way up to making my own bodice block. How do I choose fabrics and authenticity versus cost? Right now, authenticity isn't even a factor. It's not on my radar. Someday, maybe if the channel makes enough money, I can order in the material I need from a suitable enough time period. That is, bearing in mind you're never going to get truly authentic without your own personal TARDIS. I do envy folks finding linen in huge amounts through their local thrift stores, but Often I hear people talking in terms of one or two yards, and my body isn't small enough to make an entire garment in one yard. Maybe a layer of a corset or a set of stays, but making a dress out of a couple of meters of fabric is not happening anytime soon. I'm trying to concentrate on dressing the body I have, not the body I want to have. Right now, just cutting into a fun cotton is hard enough because there's always that little voice in my head saying, you hold off just two weeks and really watch your carbs, you could make this in a smaller size. And folks, that's not healthy. So I'm hitting the discount stores and clearance aisles, and I'm sorry if I come home with a lot of weird colors. I do try taking my swatch wallet with me so I'm not coming home with something way out of left field. Have I heard about the Starfall Ball in Edmonton? I had not. But then I haven't been one for large groups of people since I got locked in at the Calgary Entertainment and Comic Expo about a decade back. Nothing like a comic expo to instill a case of social anxiety and a fear of large crowds. Coasters are nice, but how about tatting some insertion lace for cuffs and collars? Maybe even a waistband. Couple of reasons there. The first assumption is that I want to stick around the late Victorian into Edwardian time period and make items that use fiddly old insertion lace and trim 
when there are plenty of other folks who have made insertion lace videos ad nauseum. The second assumption is that I want to be stuck doing the same repetitive pattern for meters on end. And the third assumption is that I haven't already started doing this. Let's be honest, part of the reason it takes me forever to make anything is primarily due to not being a very experienced sewist. That's not even taking into account any kind of competency. The other part is I'm always trying to think of how I can use my actual skills. I start off with plans of, say, making a corset in one video and embroidering or flossing it in another. I spend so much time on the first video that I don't want to look at the project again for another three months, so the second part just kind of slips away. <laughs> Pro tip, do not declare, just reef on it. <laughs> Which is the reason why the apron I completed last month is now back in its component pieces, waiting for me to grade down the bodice, let out the gathering in the skirt, and install a new waistband. I'll probably get back around to it in another month. Or year. And that's on my own time without a camera rolling. Do I have plans to embellish garments with things like tatting or crochet? Yes. As mentioned earlier, there's a multi-video project coming up that will heavily feature tatting as part of the ensemble. I'm hoping the bits and pieces of the project will make for a nice entertaining variety of videos, but for a change of pace, something small and fun like encasing motif samples in resin might be a nice palette cleanser, you know?